All right, everybody, we're going to be kicking things off in just a few moments. If you could hit that like button, hit that share button, because today we're going to talk a little bit about Star Wars with it being May the 4th. But uh, the bigger portion of the show will be dedicated to the 50 year anniversary of the Kent State Massacre and what really went down. So if you could hit that like button, hit that share button, get the word out. We're going to be kicking things off in just a few moments. Stay tuned. All right, everybody. Welcome to Road Reflections. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. We're back. We're back into it. Uh, doing these videos as often as I can. Because, um, uh, as some of you might know, I am going to be uh, doing a uh, live show. A, a, uh, a Zoom virtual live show. Uh, it's a show called The Citizen Revolution Comedy show uh and the first one is this friday may 8th this friday may 8th the tickets are five bucks uh they're available online they're in the description of this video uh so if you would like to come check out brand new material uh you know fun little segments uh maybe a few things that are similar to what you guys see um on this show then you should totally come out and uh check out that show uh, it is important to get tickets because uh, since it is via Zoom, it is going to um, it be imperative to get those tickets so I can send you the login information for that show uh, so that we don't get any sort of like unwanted guests in that show, right? So uh, that's why it's important to get those tickets. Uh, there is a limited amount of tickets. There is, I believe, somewhere between 12 and 15 tickets left. I'm only doing 20 tickets for the show. Um, so make sure that you grab your tickets um, early. Make sure you grab them quick because there's a limited amount of them. And if you can't make it to the May 8th show, uh, the next one will be May 22nd. Uh, and each show, I'm trying to do something a little bit different with each show. I'm trying to have more dynamic segments, more uh, interchangeable segments. So um, I'm, I'm, I'll, you know, I do... A couple of uh, traditional stand-up jokes and a couple of uh, different styles, <clears throat> different styled shows. They might be some history lessons. They might be uh, history lessons, the edutainment aspect of the type of things that I do. Uh, they might be more current events related type things, uh, news segments, articles, things of that sort. So, um, yeah, so that's coming up on May 8th. So with that in mind, I am working... Um, quite a bit uh, on the show, not just working on the material, but there will be some visual elements as well that I will be using. So I'm working on the visual elements of the show as well. Uh, so that's going to, um, that's going to, that's going to mean that I'm, I'm going to have to dedicate a, a, a decent chunk of my time. Um, these videos are a lot of work doing them every single day. Uh, I was just talking to somebody about this earlier and, uh, you know, it's, it's like five, six hours of work to do the research, take all my notes, um, gather all my thoughts, record the video as you are seeing right now, it being recorded, uh, pre-record the video, um, convert it, cut it into clips, upload it, get it ready. And then, and then hang out with you guys and watch the, watch the video, answer your comments, answer your questions, things of that sort. So because of that, it takes a long time. Uh, to get done. So um, I'm going to be doing these videos as much as I possibly can this week uh, because I'm still laying the foundation down. Um, and as I mentioned yesterday, uh, this weekend I did a storytelling show for Pittsburgh Fringe that was also via Zoom. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot. It's a lot to kind of maintain. So um, I'm doing the best I can to, to ensure all that. Um, and taking care of, you know, uh, my mental and physical health, because <clears throat> that's important in times like this. So, um, 
going forward, I'm going to be doing a bunch of these Zoom shows, and they're going to involve interchangeable pieces here and there. So each show is going to kind of be different. Uh, each show will be a little bit different. So if you wanted to, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to make it so that if you wanted to come see like all of the shows in June, all of the shows in May or something along those lines, um, you can just like purchase a thing and, uh, you know, I can give you a code that is going to guarantee that you get a ticket every single time that you come in. I, I don't, I don't know. I haven't particularly figured that part out yet. Uh, but you know, these shows are, I'm, I'm keeping them relatively cheap. They're only five bucks. And, uh, and I'm also, you know, uh, if you can't afford to come see them because times are super, super tough, uh, I, uh, understand. <clears throat> and if you email me, message me, whatever, I will, uh, get you a ticket. So, uh, you know, just, just message me and there's limited spots for that. Uh, sustaining members, if you become a sustaining member, you get a free ticket to come see the show. Uh, sustaining members get a free ticket to attend the, the show. All of them, you, nobody has to, to pay for a ticket uh, if you're a sustaining member. So you can do that by going to ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. Uh, but like I said, you know, um, th this is sort of the way that I'm making ends meet at this point. Uh, trying to trying to get by, trying to survive, uh, through these, through these difficult times. Um, so, you know, this is sort of my creative endeavor and, uh, it, it still, I mean, it still means that I would say like at least 80% of, uh, what I would normally make by touring around the country is, uh, cut. So even doing these shows, it's supplemental and definitely 100% helps on a financial level. Uh, but it's not sort of, I, I don't know. It's difficult to say because I don't know how popular these shows are going to be. I think they'll be they'll 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 do okay. People are people seem to be purchasing tickets and things, uh, so that's kind of cool. But uh, yeah, um, doing that. And other than that, I'm doing pretty good. I'm looking forward to getting back into like physical shape this week. That has been uh, like last week. I didn't do that. I didn't, I didn't really exercise a whole bunch. I went for maybe like one walk or something, but I, but I, and I think it did end up affecting my mental health a little bit where I got, I had a pretty pessimistic Friday. Um, and you know, majority of Saturday, I felt kind of pessimistic about everything going on. Like I was just like, who gives a shit? Who cares about what I'm doing? This is all bullshit. Uh, you know, and I, and I was stressed out, um, and I didn't, I don't know, I think, I think having like a physical outlet for stress and things of that sort is, is, uh, helpful and I need to keep that in mind. So I'm looking forward to kind of maybe having a little bit of time to do that. Um, but you know, other than that, I'm, I'm, I'm doing solid. I hope that you guys get those tickets, come hang out with me, um, and do that show. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I have for the check-in right now. Uh, so being that it's May the 4th, let's talk about a little bit of Star Wars. Being that it's May the 4th, let's talk about Star Wars. Uh, here's the thing. I am very disappointed in this franchise right now. <laughs> I, um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, a big nerdy dude. And uh, I watched all of the Star Wars movies. I've watched most of the animated shows. Um, I haven't seen the new season of Clone Wars. And I haven't seen Resistance. Uh, and I plan on it. But I haven't done that yet. Here's what I'll say. Um, I was a big fan of it. I mean, when I was a kid, I watched the movies. I watched the original movies. And it was, like, incredible, right? Like, it was like Space Samurais. Uh, this is... This is crazy, uh, and uh, you know, and then and then there was a uh, Empire was Empire was not. I was like, I don't, I don't know if I was particularly able to handle uh, what happens at the end of Empire because I thought Darth Vader was lying to Luke Skywalker about being his dad, and uh, when when I was a kid, like I just couldn't fucking come to grips with that, right? Like it's just not something that like a child can come to grips with is like the bad guy is the dad like that's not 
And then I was just like, no, I, because of my shitty relationship with my dad, I was just like, no, that's actually possible. That's, <laughs> that's, that's like a real thing that can happen. Uh, but what was cool about Star Wars, eh, you know, it, well, I'll, I'll say what was cool about Return of the Jedi was that there, it wasn't this like, um, it was a redemption arc for Vader and Luke putting the, the lightsaber down is what creates that redemption arc for Vader. And I thought that was a really cool moment. Uh, so, you know, I, I went back to rewatch them. I think I've rewatched them twice. And, I, you know, you kind of got to put your rose-colored nostalgia glasses on when you watch it. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, it's been a long time since I've seen Empire. I think I've recently seen um, Return of the Jedi in a hotel room. I watched it, you know, just kind of sitting there taking care of some emails and uh, waiting for waiting for for gig time. And I still like I still like Return of the Jedi. I know there are some people that don't like Return of the Jedi, but I still like Return of the Jedi. I think it's a fun movie. Um, I like Empire a lot. New Hope is fine. <laughs> like it's not the best in the trilogy um, and it's fine. But after that, I mean, I remember watching the original ones when I was a kid, too. I, I went to uh, see it in theaters, um, and uh, I remember being very excited. Like, I thought Darth Maul was, like, super cool as a villain. Like, I was just like, how are they going to... Two, he's a, he's a double-bladed space samurai with horns? This guy's crazy. How did that happen? You know? That was really neat. Um, the... Second movie is fine. <laughs> Attack of the Clones is fine. I remember it being fine. Uh, I remember walking out of the theater being like that. Ah, that was that was a movie that happened. It had a it had characters and seemed to have some sort of a plot point. Uh, and there were some lightsaber battles. Um, third movie I I enjoyed Revenge of the Sith. Uh, I gotta be honest. I remember uh, very much enjoying Re Revenge of the Sith. And, um, the, you know, the Obi-Wan Anakin Skywalker battle, uh, was, um, was pretty, I mean, I, I, I remember be, like, I was like pretty impressed by that battle that the whole CG battle, uh, was, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous, but it's also like, we are talking about a society of space samurais here. So maybe we shouldn't be like, but the science of them fighting in the lava, they talk about the force. Okay, they're basically like telepaths and telekinesis and, and possibly some alchemists. Okay, so, I don't know, the force shield. There you go, boom, boom. Question answered. Let's not, <laughs> let's not overwhelm when we go through the sides of, but they're in the lava pits, and it's just like, all right. There's a guy that can shoot electricity out of his hands. What, what do you got for that one? Is it because it's science fiction? <laughs> You know, like, people freak out about it. Um, overall, uh, you know, I I don't know. I think the the prequel trilogy was like, yeah, we all knew Anakin was going to become Vader. Like, that was sort of the fucking point of it. And then I I thought Rogue One was incredible. Like, it, it, I think it's the best story, uh, best Star Wars story. Uh, the characters are really well written. The uh, the story was very interesting to watch, um, and holy shit, that end, that end, holy shit, you guys. Um, by the way, if you haven't seen Rogue One, this is, there, there are going to be some spoilers in this, but that end when fucking Vader just, when you see that lightsaber launch, I was like, that is one of the most, like, intense and scary scenes in, uh, it, you know, <clears throat> in all of the Star Wars franchise, in my opinion. And then we get to the sequel trilogies. And I really wanted to like them. I really, really did. Uh, but, you know, I have no problem with having a female protagonist. I have no problem with having a black Jedi. Like, Mace Windu was one of the most powerful Jedis of all time. Like, he pretty much almost murdered the Emperor 
you know, like, and the chosen one had, like, problems with defeating the guy, right? Like, you know, like, Luke Skywalker had issues with defeating Emperor Palpatine, but Mace Windu was just like, I'm gonna fuck you up, and then he did. Um, and if it wasn't for Anakin's bitch ass, like, he would have, <laughs> he would have finished the whole thing. Um, so, you know, it's like the identity politics, the, the identity of the protagonists has no bearing on whether I like or dislike a character. What I will say is I think um, Ray and uh, Kylo and uh, all these new characters that were introduced, like, they just weren't developed very well. And then, you know, there's these random points of development where they switched directors and they didn't really have a coherent storyline throughout all three movies, so it was like, oh, J.J. Abrams wanted to make a New Hope fanfic um, and just introduced a bunch of new characters. That's cool. And then the second movie was like, oh, Ryan Johnson seems to be trying to tell an original story from after J.J. Abrams' New Hope fanfic. And then the last one was like, oh, it looks like J.J. Abrams is trying to do an Empire plus a return fanfiction. Uh... And I've bitched about all these movies, and if you want to see me bitch about all these movies at greater length, uh, I went on my friend's podcast, P.O. Vincent, my friend Vincent Didiano and I uh, talked, about, um, talked about the movies. And here's the thing, is when I watch these movies in the theater, I do have a good time watching them. Like, I have fun watching them, because I'm with my friends, you know, like I'm with my loved ones, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying their company, and there are some very cool scenes in these movies, like the lightsaber duels and everything, and, like, you know, there's some cool themes that are addressed throughout the movies, but they're, like, kind of half-witted. Like, one of the things is, um, you know, there's that lady general with the purple hair, and she just, like, won't tell Poe what she plans on doing, and then she makes him feel like an asshole for her not giving him information. I was just like, what is happening? Like, why didn't you just tell him? Like, it seems like it would have been fine if you told him, you know? And and it was just like, the men. And it was just like, that's not, no, she just didn't tell. Like, that's a communication problem more than an identity problem, right? And it, it, so there were these subtle things that I feel like um, the sequel's just I, fucked up. And then, not, and then beyond that, too, it's just like, it's bad... It was bad plot structure. Like, there wasn't really a through line. Each movie by itself could have just been its own thing. And if it had been its own thing and they would have, like, made three separate Star Wars movies, I'm sure they would have been fine, right? But, you know, I gotta say, a uh, little disappointed. I will say the animated series are way fucking better. They're way better. They explore the lore, um in a lot deeper way. They tell the story in a lot better way, in a lot more entertaining way, because uh, they have a long form way of doing it and they explain stuff. Like even when I was a kid, like I was like, I don't really understand what any of this shit is, but it's it's cool. Like there's like laser swords and shit. Uh, but you know, when you kind of look at it, like the animated series really explore the universe of Star Wars, of what was created. Like Rebels is a really good show. Um, Clone Wars is a really good show. I'm sure Resistance is fine, although I heard Resistance is more, like, kiddie than, like, Rebels and Clone Wars gets into some deep shit, you know, like, they get, they get kind of intense, especially, like, Rebels, once you get into season two, gets pretty, pretty, it, there, there's some intense themes um, in there, and same thing with Clone Wars, so, you know, I enjoyed the animated shows then it, more than I did the fucking movies. I don't think it's that here here's here's the honest most honest opinion and my good friend Mark Viola and I have this conversation a bunch is it's not a great franchise. <laughs> Sorry. It's got a not a great franchise. You know, like it's it's okay, it's fine. It does the it does the job. It's fu it's fun. But uh but uh, you know, it's not a it's not a particularly good franchise. It um it has more misses than it does hits. Uh, you know, if, if we, if we have to compare it, I would say that I, I'm probably a bigger Star Trek fan than I am a Star Wars fan at this point, uh, in my life. And, and that wasn't the case when I was a kid, you know, through, through my teens and into my early twenties, like I was way more into Star Wars than I was into Star Trek. And now, 
you know, I'm just like, Trek's got it. Trek wins. You know, they have far superior shows, far superior movies. Their universe is better built out. That's where I stand on that. Happy May the 4th, everybody. Happy May the 4th. <laughs> All right. Let's get into the meat and potatoes. We got to get into the meat and potatoes. Where are we at here? There it is. Uh, 50 years ago, it's been 50 years since the Kent State Massacre. Uh, I've been wanting to talk about the Kent State Massacre for a bit, um, look into really the deeps of what happened and why it happened. Um, as we do on the show, if you're familiar with it, I don't, I don't just go into sort of the, the, the generalities of it. I, I try to take a little bit of a deeper look at what was going on. May 4th, 1970. The general gist of what happened at Kent State University was uh, the Ohio National Guard opened fire on unarmed student protesters. Uh, four people were killed, a bunch of people were injured, and uh, it's, it's like a travesty. It's like a major fucking travesty in American history, as it should be, as it should be. There's no excuse for what they did. Um, so let's get into what happened, right? Why did, why did all this happen? So Nixon, um, Richard Nixon, old tricky dick, uh, promises that he's going to de-escalate things. In 1968, he, he promises that he's going to de-escalate things in uh, Vietnam, but that didn't happen, right? 1968, things, um, things start ramping up. There's more massacres, there's more protests. And finally, in 1969, things do start slowing down. Uh, but on April 30th, on 1970, um, Richard Nixon launches the Cambodian incursion. He was going to invade Cambodia. Uh, and he did this without talking to his defense secretary or secretary of state, right? So he says one thing and then he does another thing. Uh, sounds like a politician to me, you know. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's like they don't call him Tricky Dick for nothing, you know. They don't call him Tricky Dick because his, his dong veers a little to the right. You know, it's just like it just moves a little... To the right, and he's got it, and it's it's tricky. It, the, it's no, it's because um, it's because he does shit like this. He's a he's a swindler, is why they call him Tricky Dick. the 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 penis thing, um, uh, they call him they call him old righty dong is why they uh, what they call him for for that. So it's a different that's a different nickname. Uh, that that one's not very well known. The, the old the old righty dong is. Uh, uh, you know, and it's not as clever either, you know, but I don't think, but he, I think he, he might've had the people that called him that, uh, like killed. So, uh, you know, that's why it never makes the history books. But so he, so he, you know, does the Cambodian incursion, um, doesn't talk to defense secretary or secretary of state, just kind of does it cause he wants to do it. Um, and Kent state at that point was uh, having some issues with protesters. What I mean by that is um, Kent State, as a university and organization, did not like student protesters. <laughs> like, they just hated them. Um, so, you know, they, they were seeing these protests propping up uh, across college campuses, but particularly at Kent State, there were... Um, these protests from Students for a Democratic Society and the Black Student Organization, right? They, in, in the middle of April, right before uh, the Cambodian incursion happened, uh, there was a protest because they were, uh, the university was inviting police officers to um, come on campus and run a recruitment. And the Black Student Organization and the Students for a Democratic Society were against this thing so they planned a protest. They planned a protest and they planned a walkout, um, which was pretty successful until the, the police decided to clash with them. Um, my guess is, based on how history operates, is that the cops uh, felt threatened by these students, you know, walking out and saying that police recruitment should not be happening on, uh, on college campuses. Um, and they felt threatened by them. And probably had a, a violent reaction. The students pushed back, and the, and the campus, Kent, Kent State University, revoked 
the students for a democratic union. They, they revoked them from having meetings and, and such. So there was, there was a little bit of friction between the campus and the, the student protesters themselves. So um, right after the Cambodian incursion order was put into place, that, that happened on April 30th. April 30th, 1970, Richard Nixon puts the Cambodian incursion order in place. And uh, right as that happens, 500 students uh, protest and demonstrate um, on May 1st, like the day after, right? And this, this immediately gets dispersed because of what the demonstrations were, and I'll talk about that in a second. But they basically, once they were dispersed, the, the students decided to plan an anti-war rally and protest for May 4th um, and give them a little bit more time to like organize and plan what was going to happen, right? Um, so what they were doing is uh, they were burying the U.S. Constitution because Richard Nixon had killed the U.S. Constitution um, based on, you know, what they were saying it, it, with these illegal wars and um, his, his real aggressive and negative rhetoric towards any anti-war protester or any hippie or any, anybody that was black or anybody that just wasn't Richard Nixon. Anybody that wasn't Richard Nixon was kind of an enemy to the most paranoid president that we've pro possibly uh, ever had, you know. Um, so he, so bearing the U.S. Constitution was like a symbol that nurtured Nixon has has um, killed the Constitution, right? Uh, and then there were signs, and this one's going to come. This one's going to become important for a little bit later. There were signs that said, "Why is the ROTC building still standing?" There were these. They, and they posted these signs all over campus. Now, in the town of Kent, uh, the Kent police was alleging that there were people coming out of bars, you know, later at night, and they were throwing rocks and throwing beer bottles at the cops, and, and, then, it, and then things just escalated from there, and uh, all of a sudden there was this gathering of people uh, that appeared, and there was this, the, the, these bonfires, and everybody was just shouting obscenities at these cops, and, you know, all these Kent citizens were... We're, we're just kind of getting um, violent. Now, here's the thing. I don't know what this has to do with the protests, uh, but, the, but the mayor and, and the Kent police have connected those citizens with the, protest, with the student protests, um, maybe, uh, b basically saying that because there were student protesters, the, the, the citizens at these bars... Uh, were getting aggravated. They were getting, you know, violent. They were they were th chucking rocks and uh, beer bottles at the cops and, and things of that sort. So uh, the full brunt of the Kent police was called. They used tear gas to disperse everybody, right? Uh, ma the mayor of Kent, Mayor Le Leroy Satram, uh, he freaks out and he calls a state of emergency and he shuts down all the bars. He's just like, no more bars. <laughs> That seems to be the problem, right? People and people are just chucking rocks because, because of the bar industry. Um, look, we're we're kind of facing that in our society today, right? The second that they closed down uh, bars and restaurants, everybody just went into like total freak out mode. They were just like, "When is this going to happen? When am I going to be able to go out there and get a free get a drink? Because drink, drinking is my freedom. It's my freedom. That's all that matters. Drinking and haircuts. That's how freedom is represented." And they freaked out, uh, and they and they get enraged, and that's what happened in Kent when when the bars were shut down, when the state of emergency comes into play. And I'm not justifying that that uh, Mayor Satram actually put a state of emergency in place because there needed to be a state of emergency put in place. Um, I just think that he was kind of scared and didn't know what the fuck to do, and he put in a state of emergency, and he was just like, bars seem to be a, th a problem here, shut them all down. Uh, so he shut that. She, he shut down all the bars, um, and that enraged a lot of people. And same thing now is like when the bars and restaurants are shut down, people kind of freak out. And I gotta say, you know, me thinks that America might have a little bit of a problem. I think America might have an alcohol problem. You know, we got a, we got a little bit little bit of a booze problem in the old America, right? Can't go a day without uh, going to a bar. You know, people kind of freak out. They're just like, freedom, freedom is the booze. The booze is freedom. 
I think America probably needs to find Jesus because uh, that dude knew how to turn water into wine. You know, I think that's why America is so obsessed with Jesus, right? Like, that's why the religious right has this obsession with Jesus is because we're all, like, America is just a bunch of alcoholics. And they're like, that dude knew how to turn water into wine. We got to find him. We got, because if he does, then he'll just make all the water into wine and I'll, I'll just have all the wine all the time. And it'll be holy, so it's like good. It's like like being an alcoholic. It's like it's like that's how you get into into heaven is like by drinking like god wine, you know. You know how they say cleanliness is godliness. Well, well maybe uh, maybe alcoholness is also godliness. Maybe God's just drunk all the time. That explains the platypus. Huh? It explains platypus. <laughs> I feel like there's like a little bit of a problem. So this all happens on May 1st, by the way, right? Uh, the, the 500 students, they get dispersed. The townspeople getting rowdy, getting dispersed with tear gas, both instances. And the mayor putting a state of emergency and shutting down all the bars. On May 2nd, uh, May Mayor Leroy Satram started hearing these rumors. There were these rumors going around that these radical revolutionaries were were threatening bars and restaurants and small businesses in the town of Kent to uh, to say that if they if they don't put anti-war uh, uh, posters and things on their windows, uh, then then uh, these anti-war protesters are going to burn down these small businesses, which obviously makes total sense right with uh with war being the i think the the uh ultimate highest form of violence uh and these people being against the ultimate highest form of violence uh and in order to show that you should be against this ultimate high form of violence um how do you get people to support by threatening more violence on them to show that you're against that violence? that makes sense that's uh, that's not flawed logic at all, I bet that's that's totally viable. It's just, I mean, obvi, obvi, you guys. Uh, these are still rumors, by the way. And then there's other rumors that these revolutionaries, these radical revolutionaries, um, are gonna poison the water supply with LSD. And now, honestly, you know, this doesn't sound that bad. My opinion. <laughs> doesn't really sound that bad you know if if you do it properly if you microdose the water with a little bit of lsd it it's been proven to uh have very positive effects for mental health uh it makes you uh realize that we are all one vibration flowing through the universe ever expanding until we hit the utmost reaches of infinity and come back and condense back into one point. I feel like that's a very healthy thing for us, all of us to realize, right? And if it, and if that if we're getting that from our water supply, maybe we won't be freaking out uh, when bars shut down. In fact, I talked about this on a, um, uh, a stand-up comedy album of mine. Uh, the dude that created AA, the reason why he created AA, the way that he created AA, is because he uh, took acid. So, I don't know. Seems like these revolutionaries just want us to reach a higher level of consciousness. So, because of all these rumors, right? None of this stuff is even true. Like, none of this stuff is even true, right? Like, the, no, there's no evidence that this shit was true. They were just like, I don't know, I heard. Where'd you hear it from? I don't know, there's a guy. He fucking, he said it. So it's gotta be true. Maybe we should just act on it like it is. <laughs> right? Uh... The mayor called the governor, called Governor Jim Rhodes, the governor of Ohio, and he ordered the Ohio National Guard to come in because of these rumors, because there were these revolutionaries through Kent doing all these things that don't make any fucking sense, right? Like, and they don't have any evidence that it's actually real. Like, they were just like, these gossips happened, and we should act on it, and we should send a, a, the National Guard in to protect people um, from gossip. But we're going to say the gossip is true. So we're not protecting people from the gossip. We're protecting people via gossip. So gossip some more. Uh, you know. I feel like um, the real problem here is that Nixon's 
uh, paranoia might have been a virus. And it just rampantly spread throughout the leadership of the country and everybody was way more uh, paranoid. I think what we should what we should have done is quarantine Nixon. You know, we should have just quarantined him in an underground bunker for five, six years. Would have changed the course of history. Probably for the better. You know, we would have probably been like, maybe we should microdose the water with LSD and uh, help people uh, see the truth. And, uh, oh, wait. Was that we should give health care to everybody uh, because putting a price tag on human life seems unethical and kind of crazy. And uh, no real logical society would do something like that. What? <laughs> so once the National Guard gets called and they show up into Kent, uh, the students at Kent State burn down the ROTC building. Not a good look for the kids. Not a good look for the student protests, right? This is like kind of a bad idea. Um, so after this happens, uh, Governor Jim Rhodes kind of freaks out a little bit. The ROTC building gets burned, the fires get put out, uh, and uh, they realize that it's these anti-war protesters that might have done it, these campus protesters. Right. And this is sort of validating like all of these rumors that they've heard, right? Without any cur they were just like, that's it, that's the proof. That's the we nailed it. We figured it out, you guys see. They burnt down the ROTC building, so it's got all, all of it's true. The LSD thing is true. Uh, the, 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 the the threatening businesses thing is 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 true. Uh, I, I even heard that uh, some of them um, are uh, you know uh, kidnapping babies. White babies, because this is 1970, and we wouldn't be reporting anything if it involved bl the black and minority communities. That's crazy. These are white babies that are being kidnapped by the anti-war, uh, tre treasonous, lecherous bastards. I heard I had some guy. He fucking he said in the um, in a thing. I was walking down the street and he mentioned babies, and I was like, that's probably he's talking about babies being kidnapped by anti-war protesters. So I just kind of. I filled in the gaps where I needed to with my paranoia, you know. I just feel like this is like you made a decision uh, based on like Alex Jones conspiracy theories is basically what Governor Jim Rhodes did. <laughs> like we kind of had like what if what if what if uh, Alex Jones and like a like like an actual politician fused into one. That's basically what Richard Nixon was. Uh, and then he released like this paranoia virus into the country because that's essentially how they made their decision. They were just like, I heard stuff. Did you, were you able to like prove it? Did you like investigate? And he's like, ah, I just acted on fear. Uh, so once the ROTC building gets burned down, Governor Rhodes, he has this big speech and part of the speech says this. Uh, he said, we've, we've seen here at the city of Kent, especially probably the most vicious form of campus-oriented violence yet per per perpetrated by dissident groups. They make definite plans of burning, destroying, and throwing rocks at the police and the National Guard and the Highway Patrol. This is when we're going to use every part of the new law enforcement agency of Ohio to drive them out of Kent. We are going to eradicate the problem. We are not going to treat the symptoms. And these people just move from one campus to another, to, to the other, and terrorize the community. They're worse than the brown shirts and the communist element, and also the night riders and the vigilantes. They're the worst type of people that we harbor in America. Now, I want to say this. They are not going to take over the campus. I think that we're against the strongest, well-trained, militant, revolutionary group that has ever assembled in America. He's talking about kids in college. He compared them to Nazis and communists, and then he called them the most well-trained militia in America. This dude is ramping up fear for no goddamn reason. I mean, sure, the ROTC building thing was a little over the top, 
but is that what all the other anti-war protesters were talking about? To lump that one, uh, one instance of violence to all anti-war protests is delusional. Like this is, this is just a bad idea. This is just stoking the flames of fear. And that's all this governor really fucking did. He's like, he was like pounding on desks and stuff. Uh, the, the recording has like him like pounding on desks. Just like, I'm, how dare you? I'm at the bar of the military. So based on that, um, he enforced martial law in, uh, in Kent. And, uh, um, you know, he called these people Nazis and fascists, uh, the most well-trained militia. And then he uh, enacts martial law, simultaneously eradicating the word irony from his brain. Now, at 8 p.m. after this martial law is put into place, uh, at 8 p.m., the students held another rally, right? And at 8.45, these National Guardsmen came out to disperse them, and some of them didn't want to go. And by 11 p.m., there was a curfew in effect. And uh, the National Guardsmen came back out and they were like, hey, there's a fucking curfew in effect. You got to go. And some of these kids were like, no, we're not going to go. We're going to peacefully demonstrate that we're against this martial law that the governors put out. We're against being treated like we are a, a fascist group because we don't want illegal wars to happen. We don't want these 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 lottery drafts to take place um, and endanger our lives, our teachers lives, our community people's lives. Uh, over a war that doesn't make any fucking sense. Over a war that, you know, is, is deemably an illegal war. Um, and uh, the National Guard, in response to that, uh, stabbed people with bayonets. Because that's what you do. Right? That's how you prove that you're like a a good police force there to look out for the community that you're that you're trying to protect people is uh is you stab them with a fucking bayonet makes a lot of sense so this is like one escalation after another from mostly from the side of uh the mayor the governor of the national guard uh I will say the ROTC building was um, a, a bit of an escalation from the side of the protest community. But other than that, I mean, if you count it, calling the national, uh, first of all, um, using tear gas to disperse peaceful protesters, that was, that was done earlier, twice. Then getting paranoid and freaking out to the governor over rumors, unsubstantiated rumors, and calling the National Guard. So now you have these, uh, this militaristic presence in a small town. And then you have the National Guardsmen using uh, force to get rid of these protesters by stabbing them with bayonets. Uh, so that's four accounts of, of this escalation from the... Uh, establishment side and one account of escalation from the student protesters which is burning down the ROTC building so finally we arrive at May 4th right we've got all of these points of escalation we've got all this pushback a lot of aggression I would say most of the aggression has been from the authoritarian side uh, there has been one point of ag aggression from the student side uh, but again, for the most part, that was sort of a retaliatory thing uh, because they didn't want the ROTC building there in the first place. It represented like this military presence on campus, and that's what the anti-war movement was about. It was against this military presence in a country that they believed that there shouldn't be military presence for. So on May 4th at noontime, there was a big protest, right? There were these marches and speeches and rallies on armed students utilizing their First Amendment rights to speak out against the government, to speak out against what was going on. So the guardsmen wanted to disperse the kids, and they used tear gas to disperse these students, so that the students, a bunch of them, 
uh, as they were dispersing, went up Blanket Hill, is what it was called. It was this place called Blanket Hill, and they got and they were pursued by the guardsmen. Now the guardsmen didn't have to pursue them, right? The guardsmen could have just been like, okay, they're dispersing, and that's it. But they but they decided to actively pursue them up the hill. And once they came around from the hill, the students veered left. They went left uh, to you know kind of go around the football field, which is on the other side of the hill. The guardsmen did not. The guardsmen went straight into the field and got surrounded by this chain link fence. Couldn't see another way out. To their left are students. To their front is students. And they were just like, what the fuck do we do? Um, you know, these students are still chanting and protesting and such. Um, there, there are, I think there's, there's only one source, which is like the History Channel, which is so weird. Uh, but none of the other sources that I can find corroborate this. And I guess according to, like, one of the guardsmen, um, the protesters were throwing rocks at them and stuff. Um, but none of the other sources that I can find substantiate that evidence. So it just kind of seems like, the, for the most part, there might have been maybe some people that were chucking rocks and stuff. But to be fair, they did just get tear gassed. Um, so... Again, another point of escalation from the side of the establishment. Uh, the guardsmen freak out, and they decide that they have to backtrack to go back up Blanket Hill to get a better vantage point of everything. So that's what they do. A bunch of these guardsmen start going back up, and as they're going up Blanket Hill, they're, like, paranoid. And they keep turning around and they like keep looking back at the students thinking that the students are going to come up and rush them. These are unarmed kids, by the way. They don't have any weapons or, um, or anything. They, they have signs and they have chants and they have poems and shit that they're, you know. So then all of a sudden, sar the, what was recorded as uh, Sergeant Myron Pryor began firing his 45 pistol at the students at 12.24 p.m. So all this happened within a span of like 25 minutes. The protest started. They get rushed. You know, uh, National Guard in the chain link fence, students on the, student on the left, student on the front. They decide to go up the hill, freak out for I don't know why. And then once Sergeant Pryor starts shooting his pistol – the other guardsmen go, holy shit, we must be under attack, turn around, and they start shooting with their rifles. This happened for 13 seconds. Uh, and they fired 67 rounds. They killed four people. Jeffrey Glenn Miller, who's 20. Uh, Allison Krause, who's 19. Um, she, she died later. William Knox Schroeder, who was 19, also died later. Uh, and uh, Sandra Lee uh, Schur. A bunch of people were injured. Joseph Lewis, John Cleary, Thomas Mark Grace, Alan Michael Canfora, Dean Collar, Douglas Allen Rentmore, James Dennis Russell, Robert Fullis Stamps, Donald Scott McKenzie. Um, these people, I mean, you know, one of them is paralyzed. A bunch of them just, you know, they got shot in the chest or the leg, neck wound. The last one's a neck wound. And they got shot in the butt. Like, these are... This is, this is crazy. Like, this was crazy. Now... If you look at this, you go, well, something must have happened, right? Like, something must have happened. The guardsmen must have seen something. Something happened. So they talked to the guardsmen. And the guardsmen said, oh, we were all fearing for our lives. From what? These unarmed kids with signs that say that they don't like your authoritarian presence? Or were you just being fueled by... Governor Rhodes' speech about them being like the brown shirts, which was an uncalled for comparison of all anti war protesters. This was an act of, of, of parasitic paranoia. 
is what this was. And it left four people killed and a bunch of people, a bunch of kids, four kids were killed. A bunch of kids were injured, unarmed, protesting a war, protesting actions like this, by the way. But, you know, again, Governor Rhodes removed the word irony, probably made it illegal in the state of Ohio. It's interesting, you know, that they were fearing for their lives. Nobody tell them about what's actually going on at the Vietnam War because that is going to freak them the fuck out. And they might get PTSD just from hearing what war actually is. Feared for their lives from unarmed kids expressing their First Amendment right. Words, speeches, chants. Nobody was pointing a gun at them. Nobody was stabbing anybody with a bayonet. They made their decisions based on three days of unsubstantiated rumors and a, and a sociopathic speech from a paranoid governor. Now, once this happened, you know, there's panic everywhere. And the rest of the students were, were like, fuck it, let's just, let's fucking do this. Let's, let's take this to the next fucking level. Let's retaliate. They wanted a counterattack, right? Their friends are, 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 are in the, ho- like, uh, need hospital attention. And they were ready for a counterattack. They were ready to, like, take, take on the National Guard of Ohio, the Ohio National Guard. And there was a geology professor by the name of Glenn Frank that pleaded with this group for like 20 minutes. And he said that this would be a slaughter. Like if you guys did this, if you guys rushed the group, like you are going to 100% give them another reason to fire shots. You're going to give them another reason to fucking kill you guys. And like, please don't, please don't do this. Um, So after 20 minutes, the students decided, I, you know, Professor Frank was right, and uh, students dispersed. Uh, You know, at at that point, it gave the opportunity uh, for paramedics to come in and take the injured into hospitals and make sure that people were taken care of. The National Guard believed that there was a sniper somewhere. That was never proved. Uh, The response to this protest, to what happened, uh, was a was abysmally garbage. Like, the Nixon administration couldn't have fucking given a, a worse response to this. Uh, his press secretary, Ron Ziegler, I believe his name is, Ron Ziegler, he says this, when dissent turns into violence, it invites tragedy. So essentially saying that if you choose to dissent, it will turn into violence and then that's going to invite tragedy. So don't dissent. Just listen to what we say. Go along with whatever the fuck we feed you, right? We're going to spoon feed you the information and you just believe all that shit. Don't think about it. Don't counteract it. Don't have this critical thought, this free thinking, skepticism, bullshit. None of that shit matters. Okay, you spoon feed it and you won't have any tragedy. We won't have to, if you didn't protest, we wouldn't have to call the National Guard. We wouldn't have to send people with guns to battle your signs. That's because of, that's on you guys, is basically what the Nixon administration is saying. The governor turned this, turned to violence. And the administration, the expansion of war caused by the Nixon administration, by, by the military industrial complex, by the bloodthirstiness of American exceptionalism, is what turned that day into a tragedy 50 years ago. Nixon referred to anti-war protesters as bums most of the time. And uh, one of the girl's dads, uh, Allison, Allison Krauss, her, her dad was like, my kid's not a bum. So he's insulting like kids that stood up for a cause and died because of it. And he's like, yeah, she died because she's a bum. What, what, like a, what a heartless thing to fucking say. <laughs> You know what the crazy part is, is if you look at Nixon, right, for as horrible as he actually is, he would kind of be considered liberal as a president in today's, by today's standards. 
by what the Republican Party and the Democratic Party actually do and what they stand for and how they operate, Nixon would kind of be a liberal. EPA, he had an open refugee policy. He had a much more lenient immigration policy. He hated black people and hippies and anybody that wanted to go against his war so that he could dominate with McCarthyism and military presence and create a war economy. He was against all that. But, but that's just been heightened by the Republican and the Democratic Party. And if you look at that, if we look at it within the context of that, right? Nixon called anti-war protesters bums. What did the Democratic Party look at protesters and strikers as? They don't look at them as, as good people that they need to stand up for. The Republican Party doesn't like protesters. They don't like activists. I mean, you can go all the way back to this point with that shit. So then there were more, more protests across the campuses, right? I mean, this, this kind of exploded. This became public knowledge, and things just exploded everywhere. There were all these protests all across campuses, like in New Mexico. Uh, the New Mexico Guardsmen shot some kids <laughs> because their life might have been in danger, too. They were holding up signs. Holy shit. You know, what if those words became drugs? And then what if those drugs didn't turn water into wine? I don't know why I turned into Bill Clinton there for a second, but uh, Bill Clinton would definitely not like these kids. The worst of these uh, were uh, Jackson State in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, something called the Jackson State Killings. Basically what happened in, in Jackson, Mississippi, which is already like, it's a pretty segregated town. You know, there, there, were, there were upheavals of, uh, between the white community and the black community. Um, and uh, there was, a, there was a, a, a civil rights activist that was rumored to be killed, that was rumored to be, to be dead. Uh, Charles Evers, he was a civil rights activist, and there was rumors of things uh, within the rumor mill that he had, he had been killed. And uh, that sparked uh, some mildly violent protests and people kind of, um, you know, setting up a bonfire in the middle of the street, throwing beer bottles and things of that sort. Um, nothing, nothing worse than what the Kent citizens did. And uh, eventually the cops showed up. They used the tear gas. They dispersed everybody. And there was a bunch of student protesters on Jackson State's campus in front of a woman's dormitory that were peacefully protesting and rallying um, against the war and, 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 you know, because of the death of, uh, the, the, the supposed death of Charles Evers. Cops moved in and uh, they opened fire. They opened fire on these student protesters. And again, we got asked, well, what the fuck happened? Why did these people open fire on a bunch of peaceful protesters that didn't have guns? And the cops' response were, well, we don't know. We, we, we thought we saw a sniper. There might have been a sniper. We don't know. We thought there was a, th we, maybe, you know, you never, I don't know. Maybe I thought about it. And I, made, I thought I saw something shimmering. There were, there were these black people. And then I saw a window. And I was like, oh, black people plus window equals sniper. Duh, obviously. That's just a logical train of thought that everybody has is they see a group of black people and then they look at a window and they're like sniper 100% for sure that's the only logical conclusion it can't just be a window with nobody in it there has to be a sniper in there so we decided to kill everybody uh, two people were killed a bunch of people were wounded primarily black peaceful protest Cops fear for their lives. You've got to ask that question, right? Why does law enforcement keep fearing peaceful protests? What is it about these peaceful protests that these cops keep freaking out about? These National Guardsmen and these cops, they see peaceful protesters and they're just like, this is a life-threatening situation. And like, this could erupt into a war right now. I better take it into my own hands and I'll make it a war. I'll shoot some people and turn it into a war. That'll be me. I'll do that. Right? That's... We're going to have... Why, why? What is it about these peaceful protests that these 
that the law enforcement is so afraid of? Is it is it the fact that, you know, the protesters are propagandized against? That they are considered to be brown shirts and communists and enemies of the state? That if you protest against the, the, the pro-war, hyper-militaristic, uh, manifest destiny of the globe, American exceptionalism bullshit that, that this economy preaches... That they look at protesters as traitors and treason, treasonous. And much like the governor of Ohio said, he is not interested in treating the symptoms. He's going to eradicate the problem. And how do you eradicate the problem? You got to kill what you perceive to be the disease, which is anti-war protesters, which is anybody that dissents against a government putting forward authoritarian legislation, putting forward authoritarian laws. Maybe that's why you think that your life is in danger because of peaceful protests. Is it because the police and the guardsmen are trained to be violent, to reach for their guns first instead of looking for a de-escalation method? Is it because of hyper-masculine machismo that, that you can't talk to somebody? You can't try to understand where they're coming from. You can't try to figure out what their point of view is and see if you can talk to them and say, hey, this is disturbing the peace, which I mean, it's really not. They're exercising their First Amendment rights. Okay, well, we're going to be, you know, 500 feet away from you and we're just going to keep an eye on things. If things get a little crazy, we're going to have to intervene. It talking like that is seemed as pussy shit. You know, you got to you got to fucking you got to stand upside down and beer bong and shoot an AK at a target that's moving and that's how you prove you're a man. Cops. Or is it all of the above? Or is it that the whole law enforcement industry is a bunch of paranoid, overly violent, hyper machismo boys with guns? That's what the law enforcement has become. Which is a problem within law enforcement and military and the National Guards and all sorts of stuff. Systemic problem. So as we see more racial violence towards black people and minorities in this country from, from law enforcement itself because of all those problems. Now, how did the public react to this? Right? There must have been outcry from the public. 58% of the people blamed the students. 58% of people blamed the nonviolent student protesters unarmed, nonviolent student protesters for getting shot themselves. Boy, victim blaming was sure popular, huh? What a fun thing to do. 31% of people that uh, didn't have an opinion one way or the other about what happened. 31% of people saw unarmed, nonviolent protesters and said, yeah, it happens. Yeah, it's just the way things are. What are you going to do? I got to fucking watch... Uh, Whatever is on the boob tube. Hopefully some boobs. You know, they don't call it a boob tube for for no reason. Am I right? Am I right? Are we done with the interview? 31% of the people had no opinion. At kids getting killed by the American government. This is the reason why we have seen a rampant expansion of unexcused militarism because there is not enough people standing up against it. There are a lot of people that are bending at the knee at military massacres under the guise of patriotism. 58% of people blamed the students because they thought they were unpatriotic. That's insane. How many people today think that way? I would say it's less than 58%. I would say that because there were 58% of the people 
that blamed the students, that looked at anti-war protesters as bums, as, as Nixon liked to call them. And now we know the truth about the Vietnam War, that it was an illegal war. And now we know the truth about the Gulf War, that that was an illegal war. Now we know the truth about the invasion of Iraq in 2002 and what we, what we are doing in Afghanistan and Libya and Syria and Yemen. We're all, they're not for patriotism. We're not for, for, for nationalistic pride or to eradicate the world of terror, but it is about global manifest destiny to ensure that we take what America believes is theirs when it's not. And it's all for profit. And over the last 50 years, over the last 50 years, we've let this rampant expansion of the military industrial complex because it started with 58% of people looking at unarmed, nonviolent protesters and dying because it was their fault. Not because of over militarism, not because military presence exists in our own homes, in our backyard. And is doing the same thing that they're doing overseas. It doesn't surprise me. That, I mean, it doesn't surprise me one bit that we look at what happened at Kent State. We look at the public reaction of Kent State. And we look at how someone like Julian Assange is being treated. For showing that America <clears throat> killed civilians in the Middle East were ordered to kill civilians. And journalists, two Routers journalists, were killed. That was revealed by WikiLeaks and Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange. And we look at them as the bad guys. Instead of, why is the American military murdering innocent civilians? They're claiming it as casualty of war, but it's not. Is this a casualty of war? Is Kent State a casualty of war? How are you going to justify that? Did anybody condemn Governor Jim Rhodes for it? For creating this, this atmosphere of paranoia <clears throat> and vengeance towards anybody that, that uses their mind to dissent against the government that is actively willing to kill kids who disagrees with them. I've said it once and I'll say it again. Real authoritarianism, real authoritarianism will always try to convince you that it's a democracy first. And none of that shit has changed in the last 50 years. Both sides are doing the same thing. Democrats, Republicans, they're both doing the same thing. They all talk about freedom and patriotism and nationalistic pride and America first and you know, this is a country of democracy. Your voice matters, baby. Your voice matters. We love your voice. We want to hear more of it. We want you to express yourself. Get out there, you know. Take your fucking guns. Shoot it in the air. Pop, 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 pop. That's your opinion right there. That's your second and your first fused into one very loud, repetitive, concurrent noise. Both sides of the aisle want to do that. Meanwhile, they'll put laws into place like the Patriot Act that takes away your rights, like what the NSA is doing. And then 58% of America looks at them and goes, well, well, those people that revealed the truth are the bad guys. Those people that are, that are saying that we're in illegal wars after we've been proven that they were illegal wars, those are the bad guys. Those are the good guys. And unfortunately, when we see real good guys in the world, uh, they die. Now, I don't want to leave it on that t terribly depressing note, right? I, I do believe that there is a shift in the, in the narrative. I do believe that more people are coming out and being more anti-war. They are uh, supporting veterans a lot more because when you're anti-war, you're pro-veteran uh, because you don't want to see any more fucking veterans. How more pro-veteran could that possibly get? Um, we're seeing that you know, that uh, the military-industrial complex does fit into a class war 
because it's always the underprivileged middle class um, communities that get co-opted by the military in promises of riches and pride and all this other stuff um, to go die for, you know, making the already rich even richer. I think a lot more people are seeing that. And what we need to do is stand up and fight to make sure that this sort of stuff doesn't happen. So when you see military intervention um, used by America, when you see, you know, someone like Mike Pompeo get on television and, and say things like, oh, we got to stop Iran or, you know, Nicolas Maduro will never govern uh, Venezuela again. You got to look at that and challenge that shit. You got to look at that and go, what the fuck does this former head of the CIA why does he not want Nicolas Maduro in charge? Why is he trying to engage in a hot war with Iran in the middle of a global pandemic when the rest of the world has ordered a ceasefire? So you got we, we, I think there's a lot more people ready to question that right now, and those questions should be encouraged. Um, so I, you know, I, I do hope that more and more people become anti-war. I, I do, because these Kent State uh, protests are important. We shouldn't be looking at anti-war protesters as traitors to the country. They are the most patriotic people there are. Anti-war protesters might be the most patriotic people on the planet. So support them. Because they, because that's, because that's what we need to do with, for each other is support each other. Anyway, uh, I think that's uh, that's a good place to to um, end today's uh, lesson, sermon, whatever this is for you. Um, Wrapping up, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I hope that was informative. I hope you guys have a better picture of, of you know, what the, the history of these, these events are. Um, I do. I, I, I like looking this sort of stuff up and, and learning the truth beyond it and, and for trying to figure out, like, what we can do going forward, you know, because we're going to see this sort of stuff again. We're going to see anti-war uh, activists being called brown shirts and being compared to uh, fascist regimes and things of that sort. And once we kind of know that that's the tactic that they're using, they can't use those tactics against us anymore because we've educated ourselves. We have the knowledge base behind it um, and, and we're, when we're better for it. So, you know, if you enjoy this video, as always, make sure you like, make sure you share, make sure you get the word out there. Uh, that's how I reach more people. This sort of content is usually suppressed. It's not usually shown to a whole lot of people. Um, and, um, what else? Uh, come, come to that Zoom show. Uh, if you like any of the content that I've done, it's it's similar stuff, uh, more jokes, more less less loose and ranty, more kind of a structured show. Um, so 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 there's that. Uh, I'm gonna be doing a, a bunch of work for that this week, that I'm excited about. Um, May eighth, May twenty second, June fifth, and then pretty much every Friday in June, nine p.m. You gotta get those tickets. Uh, they're only five bucks. Once you get the ticket, you'll get a confirmation email. And then an hour before the show, you'll get all the login information. Um, all, all the directions, by the way, are in the description of the ticket link itself. So please, please, please read that. Read those directions because those are important directions to, that'll let you know, um, you know, how to get your tickets and how to attend these shows. Um, so... You know, that's kind of important. And that's kind of how I'm going to be making my limit living for the next couple months because I am off the road officially till at least August. And even after that, I'm not really sure when I'm going to be touring again because of the state of everything. Um, so, you know, that is it, it, it's kind of left me in, a, in, a, in a, a bit of an irksome place, but I'm not the only person that's in an irksome place. I think a lot of places, a lot of venues and a lot of performers are in that same irksome place. So. Uh, you know, if you have the means to uh, become sustaining members, that helps me out a whole lot. If you have the means to do that, if you um, even if you make a one time donation, that would be super cool, too. Uh, I'm going to be coming out with a new album in a couple weeks. I'll talk about that later this week, but keep your lookout for that. But everything on my band camp right now is available as pay what you want. So if you're struggling and you're having a hard time, and you're like, I want to listen to something that's going to fight back to the establishment and give me a little bit of peace of mind. Go check out my comedy, download it for free, um, and just enjoy it. I just want people to be able to enjoy this sort of stuff. So that's why all my content, very little is behind a paywall. Uh, if you can make a donation, that's awesome. If you can't, that's totally fine too. 
uh, maybe hit that share button. Maybe hit that like button. Get the word out there. Uh, I'm going to try to do as many of these this week as possible because I am working on that Zoom show. So, um, yeah, stay tuned for it. Until tomorrow, we'll see you on the road. Bye, guys.